Good morning, good evening, good afternoon, wherever you may be in this crazy world. Hello. This is Brendan Isaiah Bankston coming to you live. What's up, everybody? How's it going? You got this. I do. I got it. I got it. I got it. Ah, I should have lost it. <laughs> it's my favorite part of Fight Club. All right, um, let's pick up where we left off. Um, yeah, we are working on this particular character. This is a concept from um, Bjorn Heary, who's an awesome concept artist in the industry. And he um, put this together for his uh, book called Abominations. It's a conglomerate of a lot of different concepts that he did. Um, if you have not had a chance to go grab that book, um, I would highly suggest checking it out. It's amazing, amazing work in that. Anyway, so uh, Bjorn's a buddy of mine, so I decided, uh, yeah, it'd be fun to, to do one of uh, one of the concepts as a um, as a character in three dimensions. So that's what we're doing. Um, we are half we were probably i think uh i don't know maybe 16 hours in something like that um if you have not had a chance to see the previous episodes uh you can go to zbrushlive.com and find uh brendan isaiah bangston's author page because that's me <laughs> And uh, you can see all the um, the, the previous uh, ones. But this is where we're at now. We have got most of the block out done and are starting to get into kind of uh, secondary forms and um, starting to think about high res details. So that's where we're at and we're gonna keep going. Um, yes, you're more than uh, welcome to throw out questions and I will do my best to answer. Um, yeah, uh, that's what we're gonna do. So, uh, here we'll take a, a look around the model real quick in case y'all's first time here or haven't been here for a while. I'll just take a quick look. So this uh, is a demon general that um, grows her bony structure uh, antler things with the amount of kills and victories that she has. Um, so that's the lore that Bjorn gave us for the for the character. So um, yeah, that's this is what we're where we're at 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 the moment. You can still see as we kind of get in close. There's a lot of just basic secondary forms and primary forms. So we're going to start today with. Um, Probably gonna work on the arm some, arm some, arm some. We'll take a look at what is this? Yeah, we're gonna try blocking out some of the uh, the more secondary shapes in here and just get the overall feel of this thing in Michigabob. And then we just may jump around. I still have yet to find a good way to do um, this stuff, so we may jump into that. We may jump into refining some of this stuff. It'll be a little bit more kind of go as you feel type of type of day hello what's up grubber what's up grub not so much you know eating all right so uh let's see there is uh what did i do last time since last time uh i just blocked in a couple of quick forms um just to see what the light source is doing and see if we can get a couple of extra little details in there uh, ZBrushing. Yeah, hey, me too. Um, I did, uh, punch a couple holes in this guy. Um, it was really easy. In a model like this, if she had hair, would you block in with fiber mesh or with normal shaping? Uh, I think it really depends on the hair. Um, i most of the time I, I probably wouldn't spend too much time on, uh, fiber mesh. Unless I'm trying to do like super nice renders for a presentation or something, 
um, I probably would just go with a quick sculpt um, of the hair just to get the overall volume and shape, and then would take that into um, your hair and card placement pipeline. That's what I would do. Um, yep. Oh, thanks, guys. Appreciate it. Uh, it's all still super blocky outy, but it this is the power of having really uh, good shapes and primary and secondary forms. Because if you can nail down um, your early stage block out looking pretty good, I haven't done any of the, the legs though, because you can see it's just, I, I really should be doing some of that, but I hate feet, so. <laughs> um, so yeah, it just goes to show you that, you know, it, the, f the block out phase is so important for the overall presentation of, of the character. Cause if you can get that looking good, then all the small little detail stuff is just highlight, you know, literally highlight depends on your roughness map though. Um, yeah, it's just, um, good stuff. All right. So let's. Let's start blocking out some of this stuff. And we're going to go ahead and you can, s well, he can't really see. Um, let me think, let me think. Maybe I should, you know what, maybe for you guys, I'll just go through the pain of, for you guys, go through the pain. So let's import the reference. And then maybe we could just bring that up while we're doing it. What's up, Chimera? Ch Chim Sumerian. 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 Maybe it's a, not next to my mouth. How's the volume? Maybe I'm just talking low. I'm using my low voice. Uh, let's see. Let's see if we can open this. Bad Mama Jamma. Yes, you had problems walking through doorways. Uh, completely agree. All right, so I think we can pull that in here. We hit uh, add to spotlight. Cool, there we go. And let's scale this down. Let me pull that over here. Um, yeah, that may be a little too really unruly. That's just for you guys. All right, I'm just gonna keep looking at this through. Okay, this is what we'll do. Um, I I tend to keep some reference just behind the screen, and what I do is I use this see through quite a bit. So I'll just pull this see through down a little bit, and then I can see. Oh yeah, cool, cool. It's it's doing the thing. Doing the thing. Doing the thing. Yeah, I was um uh, I've been thinking about kind of cheating in the horns a little bit. Like if we just do like a you know, something like that. I'm going to see how it looks when we get uh, a little bit closer. Yeah, I like this um uh Quadro program for yeah, I could use always on top, I think, but whatever. Uh, it's it's for you guys, so I don't care. <laughs> Just kidding. Arr. All right. Um. So let's see. It kind of has a couple of different things going on. Let's see. This that's that's one piece. So that's one piece. That's one piece. That's one piece. Yeah, I think we I think we could just do this quite easily. So let's redyna mesh. So let's give it like maybe a five twelve. Yeah, it's plenty for now. Um little trick I like doing um when I up res from a, a dynamesh that has kind of the jiggy jaggies on it, um, is I'll just do a quick clay polish on it. Uh and that usually cleans up um, the jiggy jaggies and still retain some of your overall form 
just make sure that you clear your mask after you're done with that because it will leave a little mask. You can see got these little those little jibber jabbers there. <laughs> yeah, thanks, man. It's really just a, just about um, you know n having a great concept and being super diligent about um, nailing forms. <clears throat> no, I mean not uh, nailing forms. And then um, the, the thing that that I always try to do too is always be making sure that you're looking at things in uh, silhouette from all sides, right? Because it's not. Basically, you don't want a bad angle of anything um, on your model, right? If you have a good angle and it looks good from from everywhere, then it's uh, you're not going to have one of those like ew, ew, kind of moments, you know. Um, it's like the difference between okay animation and amazing animation, um, where you have just super awesome shapes from every direction. Um, but if you spend a little bit of extra time making sure that those forms read well, uh, it's just icing on the cake after that. So it looks like we got, maybe I'll just... We'll just use some masking here. So we'll just pull this. How do I create the straps on the arms? Uh, the same way I do every day, Pinky. Um, just kidding. Uh, usually, I have this method for extracting um, things, and it's pretty much the way I did all of her armor. O almost the entire set of armor I did this way. So I'll show you really quick how I did it. So uh, you can actually see right here, this is the way. So I take uh, the base, because the, the basic idea is that I want to preserve uh, the curvature of the underlying form. Right, so I want this, whatever this form is, to go around the form as easily as possible. So the basic idea is to extract the shape from the arm and then create new geo. So uh, what I'll do is I'll just go in and I'll mask where I want the thing to go. Um, is this one, or is it this one? This one has the sub D's on it. Okay, so uh, I'll make sure that I don't do it on the body that I have that is my actual base. I will duplicate it real quick. Um, and then what I'll do is I'll delete lower, delete higher. And then I'll just do a quick um, control W, which will apply a um, poly group to your masked area. And then there you go. So you got those pieces. I don't need these down here. I don't need this up here. And this is why you want to make a, a, a copy of the base, right? So that's that's what I want. Um, I'll just do delete hidden, and then I'll do this um, polish by groups real quick. Polish by groups is in deformation, polish by groups. Uh, and then we'll just do a quick uh, Z mesh. So we'll say the same, put this to about 20 by 20. Zero mesh it real quick. Cool. Do a couple more polish. And then maybe we'll do half zero mesh polish. All right. So then that's how you got the basics there. I'll turn the body back on. And then I'll just use my um, Z modeler brush if I want to commit to the thickness. Otherwise, I'll just use dynamic subdivision, which is awesome. Uh, and in dynamic subdivision, I'll just give it like a 0.005. There you go. You got your straps. Just like that. Easy peasy. So that's how I did um, That's how I did this one. That's how I did all of these pieces, all of these pieces, uh, shoulder pieces, uh, this piece side pieces, all the back pieces. I just did that way. Uh, it's a really, really quick and easy way to do it, and you preserve all the curvature underneath. Like that. 
Oh, uh, so if you go into geometry, into dynamic subdiv, and you turn on dynamic, and then you just add a thickness to it. Like that. And that's actually at what these are. Right, you have, uh, so basically these are just planes that I have uh, zero meshed. Super easy. And then that way I can, uh, during the blockout phase, it's really awesome because I can just, um, I, I can keep them as a flat plane and move them around however I want to. And then the dynamic um, will always be whatever the thickness is that I keep it at, right? So I can move this, um, I can move this around however I want to, and it keeps that thickness. That's why during the blockout phase I use this because if if you have um, like if you apply this, then you go like this, or you kind of moving stuff around, then all of your thickness is like just trashed, right? And then you have to worry about oh man, I gotta fix the thickness and blah 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 blah. Nope, just use dynamic subdivision with some uh, thickness on it until you're ready to commit it and uh, do high res stuff. Well, the other awesome thing too is that if you do it if you do it smartly, um, you can actually get this a little bit lower and then use this as your low res. Eh, eh, eh. Cool. Uh, and that's how I did uh, the the block out for these guys too, as I just duplicated the arm and then uh, just just uh, masked and uh, pulled it pulled out a um, a poly group. That's that's how you do it. It's crazy kids. All right, now I'm I'm just kind of to get a couple of shapes happening here. And this kind of comes in like this, and then just fades fades out. This one this comes down in here, kind of comes up, and then let's pull. We got that. Um, whoa, <laughs> easy there, buddy. Let's just do this. Uh, so some of the things that I'm I'm looking at uh, while I'm doing this is I'm 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 continually thinking about the core art values, which are uh, you know repetition small, medium, large shapes, frequency of detail, um, uh, you know, are you using parallel lines? How are you using complementary shapes? Um, so in, in this particular case, uh, I'm looking at the relationship of these forms that I'm blocking in now with these lines and these lines, right? So do I want it to, to kind of go in like that, or do I want it to be you know, parallel with this line, and then kind of come up and, and mimic this. That's kind of cool. Um, so I'm always thinking about the shapes that I'm working on and how they read compared to the shapes that are, are around it. So what I'm looking at is uh, also small, medium, and large reads. So in this particular case, um, the distance from say here to here, from here to here, and from here to here, right? We've got basically a medium, a medium, and a small. So it may look a little bit weird if you have two mediums and a small. What if we had, instead, we brought this in or out a little bit further so that we have a large, medium, and small shape? That may actually read a little bit better, a little bit more organic feeling. Um, the, this is uh, this is a little too close to that edge there. Maybe maybe what I'll do is I'll just have it run parallel to that. Might be kind of cool, and then run into this um, this form that comes down like that. So then what I can do is just invert that, and then we'll just organically just pull that out. So there's a couple of different things you could do here. You could extract it um, 
if I want it to be a separate piece, or if I don't want to manage um, a ton of pieces, I, I could just say, oh, I, I want to keep it the same piece and just It depends. Um, if you want to manage that that fall off, I'm gonna I'm gonna try it this way because I'm I'm already at 105 sub tools and I feel like it's gonna be a ton more. So if I can get away with just keeping this in just one sculpt, um, then that's what I'm gonna try to do. This little hook is a little bit weird. Um. The final render will probably be in a game engine, since since this is going to have, uh, ideally, um, game materials on it. So I probably will do final renders. I mostly do final renders for my game work in uh, Marmoset Toolbag. So this is the other thing that, that you can do too and, and pay attention to. Um, and I, I learned a lot of this like small little detail um working on a lot of iron man stuff uh for he for his helmets and and all that so all of the all of this stuff makes a huge amount of difference uh when it comes down to shape fidelity um not only are you looking at the overall shape of what the piece is but you're also looking at the fall off and the the roundness of uh you know the bevel width for some of these and you know are they what's what's the um the the vertical fall off, right? So it, on maybe on this side it has more of a 90 degree, but on this side like it has 90 degree, and then it fades off from a 90 degree to like you know a, a 10 degree or something, right? So looking at making sure that you have a, a nice variation of uh, of that kind of stuff too is is actually really cool. Um, are you going to retopo in ZBrush or another app? I've actually, um, I tried to do a lot of my retop, uh, a lot of my low res uh, in ZBrush. And what I mean by that is the, the, the idea that I had here, which is, you know, I'll, I'll create a low res piece and then I'll dupe that off, or, you know, I'll, I'll dupe it off and then do my high res sculpt um, on a higher res version of this. And then I could technically just get rid of this interface and use this as my um, my low res. So I, I think about those types of things while I'm um, while I'm sculpting and will try to keep as much of the low res stuff as possible. Or at least, you know, in this case, this is probably more medium res. So I, I may keep that as a medium, but, um, you know, try to try to take it lower later if I'm if I'm ready to um, to do the thing. Uh, how do you spend? How do you speed up or boost up? Do you ever stuck in modeling? I get stuck in modeling all the time. I think that's one of the the hardest things for me is know when know when to um, call the hand. You know what I mean? All right. What is that shape feeling like? Um, this thickness in here feels a little bit weird, kind of uneven. Um, this almost feels a little too close to the edge. Uh, I, d I don't know, sir. I didn't like it. Okay, maybe we can pull some shapes around just a little bit and see if we can make this feel a little nicer. So maybe we can just kind of smush and push some stuff a little bit. And this is where it starts to get a little bit hairy and we start kind of moving some of this around and things get a little messy. You got to learn to learn when to call it. It's a nice balance between spending enough time and spending too much time. Yep, I don't like it. I'm gonna go back. Okay. 
Maybe we'll just pull this in just a little bit. Yep, that's fine. So instead, this time I'm just going to extract it and just make it a separate piece so that I can... Um... What's up, side effects? How you doing? Oops. It's going. It's going. We'll see if we can get this to look a little bit better. Okay, so I'm just gonna extract this off because I'm I want to be able to play around with the shapes a little bit without having to worry about um, weird sculpting stuff. So I'm just going to uh, hit Control W and that will apply a new poly group. Then what I'll do is I'll just hide that. We'll do split hidden. Um, so th what's really cool is if you use this method and you do split hidden, it it bumps out the thing that you want to work on. But then uh, with the thing that you split off, you can just undo like that, and then you can keep um, you keep the the piece underneath, and then you have a new piece that you can um, right. You just go down to this piece, and that's a whole new thing. So you can split it off and then undo it on that particular sub uh, the sub tool, and then you can retain your new one. All right, we'll just clean up the edge a little bit. Uh, we'll just do it once like that. The thing you have to watch out for a little bit when you're using this method of the um, polish break groups is that it will it will pretty much kill the corners. So if you just mask it, um, then you can fix up all the other ones. All right, and then we'll just do a quick zero mesh. Personally, I like 20 by 20 for adaptive size and curve strength. It gives me a, a nice mix of uh, decently spaced polys at um, uh, quads. So we'll just do, we'll just, I keep it at like about half and then I'll just kind of keep going down a little bit. And we'll just do that again real quick. We'll keep that, and then we'll do polish for groups a little bit. Cool. That's good enough for now. I'm just going to sculpt over this anyways. Um, so then I'll do a Shift D, which is my shortcut for dynamic subdiv. Then I'll put in um, a thickness to it. So let's just say that's good. <laughs> What's up, Alex? How you doing? Relaxing after some hit. Nice. Let's pull this down to like a something like that, maybe. the The downside of doing it this way is that um, it becomes a little bit too geometry feeling. Okay, maybe we'll just. Um, Let's apply. I'll have it here. Apply. It's right there. And then we'll give it a one division. And then we'll just smooth out the edges a little bit. Um, so this is really good for if you want things with really nice edges and stuff. Um, where it kind of falls down in this method is when you have want something a little bit more organic. Uh, then you end up kind of just fighting against your really nice shapes that it makes. Which is not, it's not the worst thing, but you know, it depends on what your battle is, you know. Depend, pick a battle, pick a battle. Okay, let's delete lower and then let's dynamesh it. Maybe at a uh, 10, 24. Want it to be a little bit higher. There you go. Uh, and then let's beat up the edges a little bit. Get it out of its hard surface look and feel. 
then let's just start beating it up a little bit. Uh, let's color it the right one though. Typically for color, what I'll do is um, I just use my standard brush. Instead of messing up any other brush that I'm on, um, I typically will just go to my standard and keep that one as my paintbrush. Um, so it's RGB. We'll do color pick this one. Use C on your keyboard to color pick wherever your cursor is. Yeah, it's, it's, I, f I find using the extract method really is tough for introducing organic shapes back in. So we'll see if this actually, if it actually works or not. Could, you just kind of have to be diligent about how your organic shapes go back in. And if that's your thing, if that's your jam, you're all good. I think it may be out right there. I think that these shapes are a little too, a little too soft. So um, I actually use this uh oh shoot was it under i think it's under is it under stroke let's see no it's under oh god is it under i usually have it out here i even forgot the name of it uh accucurve where the hell is accucurve you getting you guys remember where AccuCurve lives? Surface? No. Modifiers? No. I think it's under stroke. Modifiers. No. Sculptors Pro, no. Alpha? Brush curve. Is that where it's at? Is that where it's at? Brush curve. No, it's green. Oh, bless your heart, Lee. <laughs> I, so then what I'll do is I, I always, once I can't find something and I realize that I can't find it ever, um, I'll just go and put that out on my, on, on my desktop here. Let's pull this out. Let's put this right. And that's why I have a thousand things out of my. <laughs> Thank you, Lee. Appreciate that. If somebody here remember that, you can just store that. Cool. That's half my time on ZBrush. I know, right? And that's exactly why you know uh, why I have all this crap out here. Uh, so we'll use AccuCurve on uh, Move. And what AccuCurve does, in case you guys don't know, is it 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 gives you like it basically pulls a point. Um, and gives you a little bit more of a, sh a sharp fall off. So if you ever want to get something a little bit more sharp, um, put on AccuCurve when you're using. I mean, you can put that on anything. So it's right. So here's here's without AccuCurve, and I just use the pull. Right. It it basically pulls like the fall off is is much different. So it's like the difference between. Uh, like your focal shift is like this, right? Versus your focal shift is like this and it pulls something like that, right? You can use AccuCurve to sharpen up that, um, that pull. That's the one, cool. All 
right, and then uh, let, we're gonna have to work on getting this to feel a little bit more all natural. So we'll try to get some shapes coming in. Maybe we'll nub that up, and pull that in, and pull push this in back here. Then we'll have to kind of get some shape that pulls into these like this. There you go. So it's it's really tricky sometimes, and it really depends on your own personal skill uh, on if you can reintroduce, um, you know, get yourself out of a uh, out of a hole <laughs> of of shape shape language. Um, if it's something that you're comfortable with, being able to reintroduce um, a more organic feel from something that is uh, kind of more manufactured feel. It's starting to move in the right direction. It's still not entirely happy with it, but it's... the nice thing now is that I can I can move this around uh, and play with kind of the overall the thickness of it, the shape, how it interacts with the piece below. So maybe I want to like kind of curve in a little bit there to kind of mold with those forms. And maybe this is like a little elbow joint or something in here. Kind of has that feel. Maybe this one is too. This one I'm just going to duck underneath that. And then maybe we'll have it just kind of taper off into a point under this thing. The other thing uh, about using a separate subtool too is you can start playing with the overall thickness of it. You know, maybe I want this to be a little bit thicker up here, and then it thins out. You know, you know, you know what I mean, man. It's just like I just, you know, I want it to like thicken out. You know. It's the other thing you got to worry about a little bit too is when uh, you have things that are pretty thin. And you start sculpting on one side of them, you may end up pulling the other side. So I use this back face mask quite a bit, and that is in uh, brush auto masking back face mask, and that's a brush dependent uh, feature. So I'll just come in and kind of re just redo redo that thickness just a little bit, so it doesn't give me pain down down the way. I don't really care what it looks like underneath. I just want to make sure that it's not pulled through when I'm sculpting. Um, I do want to control a little bit of what this curvature is. All right, so maybe I actually want to pull this a touch, touch more like this. So I have a little bit more uh, geo to play with there. And then maybe what I can do is actually pull Right, so it goes from like a, a tight curve curvature to like more kind of feathered out curvature. I, lo I love the when things go from uh, like a, a tight um, bevel to like a faded bevel. Those types of fades uh, intrigue me. It adds a lot of lot of detail. So I'm looking at you know I'm looking at uh, small, medium, large shapes. If you know from one direction. Not the group. Uh, so like, you know, I have a medium shape. This this from here to here and from here to here is about the same. So maybe what I want to do actually is just take this and make it a little bit wider this way. So now I have a small, medium, and large shape there. Sure. Okay, that's a, that's I think that's okay for the moment. Maybe we'll get something a little bit more. We'll echo this this type of shape here as well. Happy little shapes. 
Bob would be so happy. He'd be so proud. Yeah, sure. It's also a nice uh, juxtaposition between something that's a little bit more like bony and organic versus something that is kind of machined or um, fabricated, right? So it's the same thing with this bony stuff versus, you know, this this stuff. And that's kind of um, one of the nice parts about the, the overall design um, of this particular character is it kind of plays between those organic shapes and um, manufactured shapes. Okay, now let's do something similar to the bigger piece here. Okay, now this shape. Let's see what we got. A whole lot of random. <laughs> it feels like uh, we'll just we'll just um kind of get the general sense of this kind of sweeping back uh point and a couple of these points and then we'll just do what feels interesting um the thing that i like about this is that uh it has a varied amount of thickness you know so like these pieces feel a little bit more thin than this piece it also feels like these ridges like uh, are a little bit higher, right? So even in the center of the overall form, we have some nice depth. Um, and this is another layer underneath this thing. We've got some deepness in here, maybe another little layer down here. So it has some depth even within the overall piece. So. I think maybe what I'll do it does look my my blackout looks pretty different. Let's work on the the silhouette first, right? So how do I want to read? How do I want it to read as it comes off the arm? Maybe I want it to kind of point a little bit here. Maybe we'll have a little step up from this one. It'll come out like that. So again, thinking about the depth, um, you know, from some of the outer planes to like how far it actually goes in. So it, things have this nice depth feel. I'm also wanting to make sure I have nice um, compound forms to the silhouettes. This is something that um, I've kind of championed for quite a long time with my own work, but also when I give it feedback. Um, and the things that I mean about compound uh, shapes in silhouette is when things kind of dip and dive um, across the silhouette. So it will come out, form part of the silhouette, and then pull back inside the silhouette. And then another piece will actually form m the rest of the silhouette. So what I mean by that is how, so like this piece here, it comes out, forms the silhouette, and then it pulls back inside the main shape. And then something else around the other side helps uh, define more of the silhouette. And that's what I mean by compound silhouettes. Where so, so and the the benefit is when you're moving around like this, it just the shapes become much more interesting from every single angle. Um, and paying attention to those types of things so that they don't feel so kind of just cookie cutter um, right. So like you know, from here, like you got this big piece, but then it pulls inside the silhouette at some parts. You know, so maybe I actually want to pull this out a little bit 
to help with those compound shapes. All right, so as I kind of pull around here, oh, that's cool. Like you got this major silhouette and it pulls inside of, just adds a lot more interest as you move around and it helps kind of fill in uh, the dead spaces where uh, things may not look okay. You know what I mean? So again, here, like this kind of comes out and then pulls back inside. Again, here, pull, comes out, pulls back inside of the silhouette. So I try to do that quite a bit with a lot of my organic shapes. Even with my um, kind of more manufactured shapes, I try to do that as well. And you'll see a lot of stuff, a lot of that kind of stuff happening um, around around these bits and stuff too. From Jamaica. What's up, man? Hey, what part of the beach you from? <laughs> what part of Jamaica are you from? Right by the beach. Bye. How's Jamaica? And what, what part of the island are you at? All right, so that, that's uh, another reason why I try to have um, a lot of this, uh, you know, uh, depth, what I call. Um, whereas you have the most outer portions of the form are pulled out from the deepest parts of your form. And what that actually does is it gives you much better read on the forms in the game, right? So like you have better AO bakes, you have better curvature bakes, you have better normal bakes um, when you add more of this, this type of depth from your outermost points to your innermost points. And it really helps push the overall presence um, of the fakery in the game. How would you retop of the character for a video game? Has a lot of subtools and organic shapes. Yes, it does. You'd have to take it piece by piece by piece by piece. <laughs> oh, Portland, Jamaica. Wait, there's a town called Jamaica in Portland? Is this true? Do I ever give tips to riggers and tech artists on where to rig your models for better animations? Um. I I try to let uh, my tech art team do their thing. Um, if you know they they are they are really good at what they do, and they've they've rigged a couple of models in their past. So I typically will kind of let them do their thing and just offer you know hey if I can be any help just let me know. Um, Ooh, you know what? Maybe I gotta do something for how this sticks on the hand. I'm thinking maybe we can do some kind of system where you have a strap that comes down here and a strap that comes maybe from here over, hits a circle, and then pulls to this one. Maybe. We'll see. We'll see. We'll see. That's a possibility. All right. So um, let's get some shapes on this one going as well. Okay. okay I really want this whole piece to feel like it's a little bit separate. So I'm going to make sure that I have some good depth uh, in this plane versus this plane. And then looking functionality wise, I want to make sure that um, there's some room back here for it for when you do kind of the, the palm back. All right, let's make sure this is sitting on the hand. Yeah, retopo uh, on this one is is going to be uh, painful, <laughs> to say the least. Painful. All right, I think I'm going to extract 
the same way I did here. I feel like this one kind of turned out to be a more organic feeling than um, than it was previous, so I think I may do the same thing for this one. Yeah, let's do that. Um, I, I try to do as much as the low res geo here in in um, ZBrush, where I'll I'll keep I'll keep the lowest at the lowest subdivision level, and then either dupe it off and sculpt your high res, and then you have your low res, um, or and just use zero measure to get it down as as far as possible. Um, that's that's most of the ways that I that I try to do it. Um, otherwise, I would probably take it into either Maya or um, Moto to do to do Z, um, Retapa or whichever you know. For Retapo, it's really about what you have access to and what you're most comfortable with. It's really you know. It's it's really kind of up to you. Some of them have better tools than others, but for the most part, it's it's pretty okay. Uh, if you were just be starting out as a character artist, would you focus more on getting a nice looking character on your portfolio, or very optimized one with good topology and such? Um, you know, ultimately you want both, right? Um, the, the problem with getting really, really good at, at characters for video games is there's just, there's so much that goes into it, right? You have uh, block out, you have high res details, um, you've got, you know, people who focus on heads, people who focus on hair, people who focus on um, hard surface, people who focus on organics, people who focus on creatures, people who focus on all these different things. And if you're going to do a full character, you really have to be able to kind of conquer how to read those shapes and stuff um, and then getting into the technical aspect of things um, and saying you know okay how do I how do I create my low res my high res how do I set up all my UVs the best way possible I'm thinking about how many texture sets I'm going to have in the engine uh, what's the best way to bake things um, what's the best way to break them up to bake, bake them the best? Um, how do I get all of my you know, bakes lined up the best way possible for me to get into materializing and then working on all of your materials and everything like that? So what I would do is uh, I would start, if you're just starting out as a character artist, I would do more simple characters, the better. Because the, the biggest thing that you're going to need to do is understand the full pipeline right because i'm making decisions as i'm as i'm even blocking this out as to how i'm going to you know how i'm going to retop it how i'm going to break up my texture sets for uvs how i'm going to um do material stuff all of that stuff i'm already thinking about when i'm doing this because you know you don't necessarily have to go in and sculpt all the high-res details you if you know the material phase and you know materials and what they can do based on a good bake, you can get all that stuff in the material phase, right? So my biggest thing I try to tell people when they're starting out is start with a smaller project and understand the full breadth of the pipeline. So what is a blockout stage? What is a high res stage? What is your baking stage? What is your uh, UVs stage? What is your... Well, UVs come before baking, obviously, but what is your material phase? What is your render phase? You know, what is your lighting setup, right? All of those things uh, you really have to have a good handle on. And then on your next project, you can say, okay, maybe I'll take on something a little bit, a little bit more complicated um, because now I know all of those steps and I know where I'm trying to get to so I can make better decisions along the way. So I, I would say, don't start with a super complicated character because it will take you forever to do. It even takes me forever to do, and I've been doing this for a long time. Um, this character probably, um, let's say if we're going to take this character into full production, 
I I would probably say at like two months, three months of work, eight to ten hours a day, five days a week. That's that's a lot of hours, and that's like super focused. That's like no meetings, uh, no presentations, all of that stuff is just hardcore, uh, hardcore work. So yeah, I would say start off small, make a make a little robot or something. Um, and then learn learn how to bake properly and learn how to um, use your maps to the to the best of your ability you and, and do all of that work first and then as you get more comfortable with it then take something on a little bit more complicated yeah yeah three two or three months three hours of uh, ten hours a day eight to ten hours a day yeah yeah I mean you're talking you know full like realistic full character uh game ready asset it, it's it's an ass ton of work um if you're in a full production line the question is or can i just model and optimize a posed model instead um if you're in a full pipeline in a production in a studio you don't want to do that because your riggers will kill you so basically what what your riggers are doing is saying okay i'm going to set up all these and i'm not a rigger so i'm not going to say this perfectly but the basic idea is okay i'm going to and i'm going to set up and wait all of this stuff and all these bones and i want to make sure that i, I all i have to do is mirror that to the other side and most of my work is done for me um and then when i when i move this arm you know the shapes underneath here should be about the same weight as whatever I'm doing down here. So if I'm painting weights and stuff uh, for the underarm, uh, then I can just transfer those weights to this side. Whereas if you have a pose character, your shapes, when you go to a natural pose um, or an A pose, then uh, your shapes will be different. You'll be asymmetric shapes. The other thing too is that you have to say, okay, this model has to be able to accept all of the different types of work that that pull that are used downstream, right? So what about um, uh, what about uh, motion capture, right? Well, motion capture you have a binding pose for the for the actor that they'll come in and they'll just be like, okay, here's your binding pose. Okay, cool. I'm going to start like that. Okay, cool. And then I'm going to do the thing, right? You use that binding pose to be able to snap that to the skeleton that you're using for this particular character. Um, but if you don't have that and you're, it's asymmetrical, then all of that work is, is magnified infinitesimally. Um, so it's, it's very, very important to have something as close to symmetrical as you can uh, for the rigging and the pose and, and all that kind of stuff. This model is an A or T pose, kind of a rack pose. Uh, anything that is your your arm is not straight out and it's away from your hip is considered an A pose. It just depends, like, you know, maybe some studios may have the hand out here, or maybe some studios will have the arm, you know, the elbow up here and your hand up here. Uh, but anything that is down from perpendicular to the body and away from the hip is considered a pose. But it really depends on the skeleton. So a lot of times what happens is the studio will have a standard skeleton pose uh, where all the joints are in the right places and then you need to model to that pose so that all they have to do is bind your model to the skeleton and then the skeleton already has the animation on it so they can just be like oh, okay cool um i'm gonna bind your your polys to this skeleton and then now i just inherit all of these animations that are already done uh the problem is to just uh go too much with dynamesh and i hate doing retopo i just leave the model for zero meshed but i guess it's start <laughs> yeah uh yeah, uh, a half of, uh, well, I would say, I would say two thirds of your work as a character artist is past um, high res. 
I'd say almost a three quarters of your of your work is past high res. Which method is easy to and fast to convert high poly to low with topology with all the detail? Um, the thing that I use quite a bit is, you know, let's say I want to take this piece here and I'm like, oh, I want to make a, um, I want to make a low res version of this. Well, let's take a look at it first. All right, this is Dynamesh. It's ugly, gross, like there's no way that you can use that. So probably what I would do is I would take them piece by piece and say, okay, here's my high res. Let's, um, let's duplicate this. All right, so this is the duplicate. I'm just going to make, all right, and then what I'll do is I will just Z refresh it, see what 5,000 5, polys looks like. All right, obviously that is way too high for a game res mesh, so I'll just keep going down by half, see what that gives me. That might even be a little bit too much already anyways. But then what I would do is I just uh, project this. Um, so I, I would isolate this high res piece and this piece, and then I would just use uh, geometry, no, sorry, subtool, project, and do project all. And basically what that will do is that will bind these vertexes to the positions of your high res. And then you can say, okay, well now I have, um, let's, let's just do, I don't want to turn everything off. You know what I can do? Ah, ha, ha, ha. I got it. Hold on. Hold the phone. Let's take... Let's take this one. Let's delete it real quick. I'll show you. I'll show you. Don't you worry, I'll show you. So I'm going to duplicate this one. And what I'm going to do is just... Let's isolate this. Um, I'm going to turn off symmetry and then oops, and get rid of that one. Let's just do delete hidden. And then we'll snap this to center. Okay, cool. Um, and then what I'm going to do is I'm just going to, I'm going to move this off. Okay. So let's say that this is the piece that you want to create a low res from. So I would, I would duplicate this piece and then I would, um, Zero mesh it. And just cut up a half a couple of times. Let me take this down to like 1,000. Right? Uh, probably even less than that. So let's do. Say down to. Let's say they down to here for now. All right. So now you have these two overlapping in 3D space, right? So then I, you can use project all. And what that's going to do, project all is going to say, okay, I'm going to take whatever subtool I have active, look at each one of these vertexes in 3D space, and snap to whatever other vertex um, that are shown visible in the scene at the moment. Right? And that's what that does. So it says, okay, I'm going to take this and snap it, this of this one, and snap it to um, the high res version. So that's basically saying, okay, now I have, I zero meshed it, so it, it kind of shrunk things in a little bit, but then I use project all to make sure that those vertexes are in about the same area. And then what I'll do is I'll say, all right, this one needs um, UVs. So I'll come into UV master, and then uh, I'll just do unwrap. Let's see what that looks like. All right, and then I can use a morph, Right. Okay. Cool. I have. I have UVs. And then what I'll do is I'll take this piece, and I will. Um, I'll export this as the low, and then I'll export this one as the high. And then I'll bake those two. Right. That's basically what I do, but then I'll do that for every single piece in here. That's why it takes forever. <laughs> well, but then you have to plan out like, okay, where are my where are my UVs going to be together? What kind of UV sets do I want to have? Like, how am I going to group all of these pieces into, um, you know, things that can get baked together or not, and so on and so forth and backward and on.
So that's typically what I'll do. So let's delete this guy. It's fine. Delete that guy. Um, and the other thing that you may want to do is you may want to just come in and say, okay, well, be before you send this out, like you're not going to need all of this in here. So you may just, you know, maybe what I'll do is just go in and paint a mask in here. Say, okay, I don't need all of these guys. Right, I just come in like that and then just do And obviously you want this to be after you've done all of your major shapes and everything, right? So I'll just do that and then I'll just delete hidden. Oops. You get the idea, right? Just delete hidden. And then uh, zero mesh this, I mean um, UV unwrap that one. Check it out. Right, and then you've gotten rid of basically all of these underlying uh, geo pieces to save on poly count. Uh, how many polys uh, the girl body has uh, presently? A ton because she's she's um, high res. So let's delete this guy real quick. It's all right. Uh, the base body actually is if I go down to sub D one. Um, I probably would use I may use sub D2 on her but sub D1 I think may be okay uh, subdivision 1 is f f uh, about 4,000 polys um, there's not really a standard poly count um, but there are kind of general amounts so let's let, let's say if i'm going to say okay what's my poly count what's my game mesh poly count for this person going to be i'd say i'd like to keep it around eighty thousand triangles or less um, if i really need to i can probably push it to 100 but that's that's because she doesn't have hair Right, so you're, you're going to look at the overall poly count, um, which is becoming a little bit more and more irrelevant these days with, um, we're not getting a lot of work done. We're getting a lot of talking. I hope that's okay, guys. <laughs> um, hopefully this information is super helpful. Um, but, uh, you know, with the advancements of technology and the engines getting better, the the focus has kind of shifted a little bit from okay my poly count has to be under this to now it's it's the amount of draw calls basically to say how many texture how many textures and materials does your character need to load during that time um, poly polys have become a lot i wouldn't say cheaper but a lot easier to read so you can easily get into saying you know uh, 100,000, 120,000 triangles, uh, so 60,000 quads, um, is, it's okay for your LOD zero. So like your, your highest res mesh, um, around that. If you have long hair, that's a, that's a whole nother thing. But this one, I would say for this particular character, I'd say, I'd like to keep it around 80,000 triangles, uh, maybe 90 to 100 if I really need to push it. Um, the other thing to keep it in mind is that this character probably would have quite a bit of uh, physics uh, with all this kind of drapery and stuff. And for a good physics uh, solve, you need to have a decent amount of polys in your um, drapery. So that will eat up quite a bit. Um, and then whatever animation stuff happens, right? So like all of the the horns and everything, all this is 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 static. It's not really going to move. Um, most of this stuff is static, not going to move. Um, so you can kind of get away with lower res on, on a lot of that stuff. But you'll probably eat up a bunch of polys in the uh, the drapery. Yeah.
Uh, since you had a leg that you sculpted for a critique a while ago, I kept up the practice and improved those instances. Awesome, dude. I do kind of remember... I don't remember the leg, but I do remember... I do remember... Uh, you sending me something. But I'm glad, dude. Yeah. Keep keep practicing. Keep going. Alright, let's get back to it. Alright, so this... I think what we're going to do is maybe we're going to push this back. I didn't reply. Oh, dude, I'm sorry. Did I really not n reply? Sometimes I, I get so busy and things just kind of slip. I, I apologize, man. I, I really try to do my best to um, to reply to people who's, who ask me for feedback and stuff. Sorry about that, man. You forgive me? <sighs> All right. That forgive you right there is immortalized. Can't take it back now. <laughs> All right. Well, I'll tell you what, man. If you want to send me something else in in the future, I'll I'll make sure to to crack it out and get it get it back to you. Say I, I owe you one. Okay. Oh, good, good. Motivation is is very key. All right. So let's. I'm gonna even this out a little bit because I'm I'm gonna extract something from the top of it here. Okay, let's take a look. Let's take this up to 512. Can I train you? Not in 3ds Max. <laughs> um, I I have been known to mentor some people. It really depends, though. Uh, depends on your motivation. Depends on where you're at. Depends on what you're looking for. Um. Honestly, I, I would I would attend a lot of these um, live streams. Uh, that's where a lot of good information comes out, not just from me, but from from other people too. Depending really like on what type of work that you want to work on, whether you want to do stylized work, whether you want to do characters, or whether you want to do jewelry, or whether you want to do yada 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 versus yada yada yada. You know what I mean? Okay, we we'll do a little bit of clay polish once I up res. That helps that clear the mask. All right, cool. And then what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna do the little extractor method here again. We'll just try to get some in interesting shapes happening. Is there a Discord server? Uh, for ZBrush? For Pix Pixel? Learning Anatomy Daily? Good. Keep going. I'm actually learning. I, I still don't know everything for Anatomy. <laughs> I even... Um, Scott Eaton is, I'm sure, still learning things in Anatomy. Uh, you never... Never quite get it all, but... Learn something every day. That keeps you on your toes. Maybe I want this to come this way a little bit. So I'm kind of playing off of this shapeology here. All right, so we kind of got like this little cur like curvy bit, and these these kind of things. Um, you can see that we have some of these little design motifs. So we got this little thing, we got this little thing, we got these little doohickeys, we got this little guy, we got this little guy. So I'm trying to be cognizant of uh, some of the design motifs in here and making sure that I hit those. I'm sure you can hear my girl screaming outside as well. Okay, um, I think that's fine for now so let's control w and this is the method again that i use quite a bit so i will split hidden and then undo so i can keep that and then go down to this guy and then we'll just do a quick uh, polish by groups cool we'll do a quick z remesh 
Um, so this is why I don't do 50, 50 by 50 for adaptive size and curve strength, is you tend to get some weird things happening in these areas um, where it's trying to maintain the overall shape of the outer um, And it just, it, it kind of gives you like these weird things that happen, right? So I personally like 20 by 20. And then take a look at the way the, the difference. It still has a little bit of stuff, but you see it's much cleaner around the edges. So maybe what I'll do is I'll just kind of edit this just a little bit. I found that if you, if you kind of move some stuff around a little bit, it forces it to kind of recompute all the edges. So we'll just do same. There you go. So that, that has much, much cleaner. Um, there's not a lot of uh, squishing in between uh, in the edges. So this is, that's the one I like quite a bit. Uh, what software do I use for baking? Um, I've been using uh, Marmoset Toolbag quite a bit because I, I like the way that you're able to group things. Because um, one of my biggest pain points is uh, you know your bake cages and getting overlapping bakes of things that are like sitting on top of each other so you can pretty quickly and easily and dynamically use use folders for baking in um, Marmoset tool bag and I find that a lot easier than like trying to explode your mesh and then keeping track of exploded meshes and where they're at in 3d and all that kind of stuff so All right, so let's use, um, we can use, so from here, if I'm doing organic shapes and I'm doing this, this method, um, either I can use uh, D, uh, shift D was what I have for dy um, dynamic subdiv and then put some thickness on it, whatever I want. Or what I can do is, because it's so low res, I could just use my Z modeler brush and just use key mesh. So we'll just use all polys and then I can just, oops. I can actively say, okay, I want it this thick or this thick. Um, so sometimes I just use that. If I know I'm going to dynamesh it and I'm just looking for some geo, then I'll just, I, sometimes I'll just do it this way. It's a little easier. And then I'll take the inside too and just, oops, let's do uh, polygroup all. I'll just add some thickness to it. And then I'll just dynamesh that. Something like that. Um, but let's do 1024. Give me some tips to be successful 3D character artist like me. Um, you want tips. I think the first tip I always tell people is don't be a dick. <laughs> It's a very small industry, and uh, everybody, if you work in it, you know, for any length of time, you'll you'll know people, and people will know you, and it's a very small industry. Uh, not only that, but, like, it just, there's so much knowledge that you need to have and experience, um, and that it's, 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 it takes a long time. It takes a lot of effort to get all of that experience and knowledge so sharing that with people who um that don't have it uh is a huge benefit to you and it's a benefit to the people around you so um give back don't be a dick that's the first thing uh that i usually tell people the other thing that i tell people in this almost the same breath is uh be very patient be very 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 patient Um, be patient, uh, be diligent about your work, uh, but be patient about opportunities. Opportunities, um, are a conglomerate of being at the right place at the right time with the right level of preparedness. And, uh, those aren't always under your control. 
Uh, they're actually very rarely under your control, other than the level of preparedness. Um, so I, I would say be patient. Um, stars really have to align just correctly. Even if you have, even if you're a great artist, um, the stars have to align with the project that you're on or the project that you're trying to get into. Uh, they have to be looking for you, like the right person. And you may be the right person uh, or you may not be the right person. Or I've actually found too that um, you may be the right person, but the timing is not right. Or uh, the way that you present yourself or the, some of the things that you said um, during an interview May, you know, maybe something that is that strikes true with the hiring people, or it says, you know, maybe, you know, maybe this person is 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 uh, focused on something different from what we're trying to focus on. And it doesn't mean that you're not a good artist. It just means that, you know, this particular opportunity may fit better with somebody else, which is okay, you know. And just uh, the level of of I, I just seen people get rejected. I've been rejected and it just, it, it hurts and it's, it's hard to do because you're working so hard and you're trying to get, you know, into the industry and you're trying to, to, to make cool stuff. And, um, those things I've seen get people down quite a bit. So be patient and, um, don't let no's that you get from people, uh, squelch your fire. Use nose that you get as fuel for your fire to be better, to get better. And then eventually with, uh, with tenacious stick to you'll land somewhere. You like that? Tenacious stick to -itiveness. <laughs> You're the good. What's up, Redesca? <laughs> What's up, D? How you doing, man? Thanks, buddy. Uh, yes, I am streaming at 720 right now. I have to fix that on my side. I think that's something with my OBS. So I, I apologize that it may be in a little bit lower resolution that you, you crazy 4K nerds uh, use. So I apologize. I need to fix that. All right, just trying to get some organic shapes into this thing. Um, I may be working. How many working day of this project done by one person starting while they're using for final texturing for game ready in your opinion? Uh, I think what you're trying to ask is how many, how many working days would it take to get this character from start to finish in game? I think that's what you're asking. Ha! <laughs> Pros lurking. Um, yeah, sorry. Uh, you can have a full, quick full screen here. I realize it's been a little while. So here is that, and then we'll we'll take a look at the concept real quick while we're at it. There we go. Yeah, I, I try to um, I try to stick a, at least a couple of, of one or two a month uh, streams for for Pixelogic just to keep my my feet to the fire. Otherwise, I probably wouldn't do much <laughs> personal work. <laughs> You're the cousin of the right person's aunt. The right person on the left, though. Yes. Absolutely. For entry level position in game character art, how much should I be expected to get? Uh, what do you mean, Brock? Uh, like, how much work are you expected to get? Like, how much money are you expected to get? Um, how much fame and fortune are you expected to get? How much um, uh, YouTube press are you looking to get? <laughs> yeah, a little bit, of, a little bit of Destiny and a little bit of. Um, um, Dante's Inferno. 
Dante's Destiny, I think, is is probably the. Uh... Thanks, Pro. Good to see, you, buddy. How about a, how about a um, shout out to the lurkers? Oh, salary if if. Uh... <laughs> no, I'm hearing that's that's what I was asking. I was like, no, we're not. We don't get fame and fortune. <laughs> that's not what this is about. Uh, this is about. Uh... Um, what do you call it? Uh, self-indulged pain. <laughs> self, uh, self-inflicted pain through retop retopology and baking. <laughs> um, <coughs> uh, salary. Salary is a, a a very. It's a tough thing to say. It really depends on where you live what company that you're working for you know is it indie is it um is it uh is it this or that you know uh, it's it's really tough to say what i what i tend to try to tell people is um have an I idea of what you need as an artist to um live right what's your what's your hourly rate that you're comfortable at to make a decent living Use that as your base and then go up from there, right? Don't go under that, right? So say like, okay, what are all my bills? What are all the things that I need to pay for um, in my own personal life? Because everybody's a little bit different, you know? Everybody's got different financial um, responsibilities. Somebody, some some people live in different areas where there's, um, you know, higher cost of living those types of things so i would say understand what you need to survive and then go up from there right so in and that can be um divvied down to say okay well well how much is that in salary per year we'll just do a quick uh, calculation and say okay what do i what's my base hourly that i need to have to live uh and then you know what is what is that equivalent to a, a, a yearly salary and then that's your base Right, and then you just go up from there. The other thing I would I would say is um, you can use Glassdoor.com, and they they will have a lot of times um, uh, different salaries for the for the company that you're looking at. This feels a little too small and insignificant on this piece, so I'm just gonna try to play with these shapes a little bit and see if we can get these shapes to read a little bit more interestingly. How much concept art do you usually get? That's a great question. Um, and it really, it, it really varies. It varies quite a bit. Um, even in, in Crystal Dynamics, sometimes you get something that is, uh, you know, it could you could have a full line of production art on it with turns and you know callouts and and those types of things, or you could just be like, all right, here's this crazy idea that I was you know that I was like, okay, let's let's take this into 3D and see see what we can do with it. Um, and then you you know, and then sometimes you get just just this image, and you have to uh, be able to kind of use the design motifs that are established in your in your one shot. And make up the whole back of it and the whole side of it and you know all the rest of the details that's the fun part to me i love working on some uh, a character that only has one like this um because basically what this concept is doing is it's saying okay here's the overall feel of the character um yeah i work at, at crystal dynamics um here's the overall feel of the character and then uh you know I'm establishing the design motifs that are in it, right? You know, there, there's organic stuff and there's hard surface stuff and there's like drapery and there's like drapes and all those things. Uh, and then taking that and applying those motifs to the, to the, to the rest of it, you know? So what is the, what is the, what does the back look like? You know, it's pretty cool. I, lo I love doing that and is taking things that are established and then saying, okay, like, oh, okay, let's, Let's do the thing. Yummy. Nami. Nami.
Okay. Um, you need three hundred thousand a day to live, plus cost of money and troubles. Uh, well, that's why you're not. <laughs> Is that why you're driving a mar uh, a um uh a martini? No. Uh, what is that called? A Lamborghini? Rodesca? Is that why? Are you the one taking all the jobs? You are, you dirty bastard. Uh, um, uh, I'm afraid to get a job where I can't perform, like making rope in complex alphas. Um, I have that same fear, Spear. Um, it's, uh, it's called imposter syndrome. And guess what? Pretty much everybody, everybody has that same fear. Um, what I tend to tell people is if if that's something that um, that really affects you, work on your ability to solve problems, because that's really that's really what it is, right? How know how to study, know how to break down a problem into its core elements so that you can solve it. Um, those are the skills that, because like. You know, let's say if I was given this this particular this character to do at work, I've never made this character. No one's ever made this character. So like all of the things that you need to know to make this particular character, nobody really does. Um, so you have to you have to be able to figure out how to solve those problems um, in the job. Right, so it's not necessarily like, oh, I have to do all, I have to be able to create this type of character and create this type of character. It's really is if you have, if you know how to take a problem, break it down uh, into its its easiest parts, and then uh, solve those small little parts to make a whole. Um, that's that's a better way to do it. If you learn how to solve problems, then you'll be much more um, valuable, I guess you could say. Not not valuable, but uh, you'll be, be much more confident in taking on uh, new challenges. I feel like I'm missing some things, though. Uh, if I didn't get to your question or something like that, uh, just 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 hit up chat again. I apologize if I'm not keeping up with Joneses. Yeah, <laughs> Martini Lamborghini. That's a thing, apparently. After this stream, that's a thing. Uh, I heard someone quote the other day, as your confidence increases, the pressure you feel decreases. I, I mean, for me, I, I really think it's your, how comfortable you are at being able to take a problem and find creative solutions. I think if you can do that, then that scales to different projects, whether it's like a large project or a small project, or, hey, guess what? You have to come up with the entire pipeline for the character for this, for this project. How are you going to do that? <laughs> Fuck, I don't know. I don't know. I have no idea how I'm going to do that. But then you say, okay, well, what's the problem? Okay, and then you break it down into the little things and say, okay, from what I understand, maybe this is the best way to do it. And then you try it. And then you're like, nope, that didn't work. Okay, cool. Well, then maybe this is the way or something. So breaking it down into smaller problems definitely helps. Um, how much do you divide technical study from art study? Oh, that is a good question. Damn you, Mazin. Why, why you got to get me in the feels like that? <laughs> um, how do I divide technical study from artistic study? I think, I think the answer to that lies in um, practice versus study. Where uh, when you are practicing and you're physically making the things... I think that's when you are looking at technical stuff. Um, 
But I think during the other times of your life, like let's say you're scrolling through Facebook or something, or you're at a museum, or you're just sitting out in your backyard, like that's the time when you can use your observation skills to really study why things are pleasant looking or why does this thing pop so much and why why am i looking at that particular thing oh well it's because it's it's the only thing with a higher value compared to everything else with a darker value behind it you're like oh that's cool um so i tried to kung fu i try to kung fu um i try to keep my artistic observations um to when I'm not actively doing the work so I can kind of say, okay, while I'm doing this, I'm kind of thinking about things technically. And then I'll let my subconscious brain pull out the artistic side of things and why I'm making the decisions based on what my eye sees and what my eye feels, because the rest of the day I'm looking at things objectively and saying, okay, well, why does that thing look cool? Or why does the thing stand out? Or why am, why am I attracted to this particular thing? What is pleasant about this thing? Or what's repulsive about this thing? And then, so you can say during those days and those times when you're not doing the actual art, you can train your eye to see those things. And then when you're actually physically doing Doing art, you can focus on the technical side of it while your subconscious pulls from your memory of saying, okay, well, why is this thing, why does this thing look like hot garbage? Well, maybe it's because you've got too many tangents or you're doing this or that and you're pulling from your memory. That's typically what I try to do um, when it comes down to those two things because it's really hard to study technical things when you're not actually doing the thing. Whew, that was long. I need some coffee after that one. That was a deep one, dude. That was deep, Maz. Uh, how many inches is your screen? Oh, it's so deep, too. Why two deep ones right in a row? No, just kidding. This isn't uh, 32. Um, but, 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 but how did you make those ropes? The ropes I made from a rope brush, actually. Um, I think it's on badking.au.com. But I have a... Um, curve brush that is a rope it's right somewhere in here anyways uh, if you look at it's just a curve brush and it looks it looks a lot like this and you see just use a use a curve brush to do it yeah, right. Anybody who knows what Bad King is, like you're like, oh damn, you're 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 hecka OG, you like that hecka OG. Am I California or what? <laughs> bro, bro, you're hecka OG. Dang, bro. Ha. Oh. Uh, did you start as a model or a texture in the game film industry? Uh, I started in the game industry. I haven't been in the film industry at all. But the way that games are going. It's be their game and film industry are, are quickly becoming uh, very similar. There's some things that are different, but okay, uh, we're gonna start working on this dude. Uh, I think somebody was saying, "Do I do critiques?" Uh, I love some quick feedback on a piece if you have time. Yes, uh, D. If you want to, um, if you want to ping me on Twitch, uh, if you want to DM me, right, either on Twitch or, or, yeah, do it on Twitch. It's, that's typically where I pick up most of my um, critique asks. Um, the caveat being that. Um, I, I can't promise anything, uh, but I will I will do my darndest to try. Yeah, <laughs> digital tutors. Yeah. Um, okay, so let's let's take this up to ten twenty four. Redynamash that bad moma joma. And we'll do a quick pay, clay polish. So if you make a bigger jump from like a lower uh, Dynamesh to a higher subdivision, and you do try to do clay, clay polish like this, uh, you may 
uh, you may run into this where even though you did clay polish, like it's like it's still kind of gross. So typically, I'll I'll go back and step up from there. So instead of going for something super low, I think this was at 256. Um, I'll go up to say 512 instead. All right, like that, and then do a clay polish and clean up those those shapes a little bit, and then go up to 1012, 1024. Actually, you know what? I think 512 may be okay. Yeah, that's okay for now. All right, let's see if we can get some some more organic shapes in here. Okay, we've kind of got this concave shapes happening with some spine action. This kind of thing. Maybe that kind of breaks out a little bit like that. We're gonna maybe break this piece out right around there. Um, as a character artist, is it important to know how to rig to get hired? No, Brock, it's not. I have no idea. I mean, I have the basic idea of how to rig stuff, but I, I, I have never done a rig. Um, I think the the basic thing that you may know is just how to make um, animation friendly. Uh, topology. That's that's really the biggest thing. So I'm trying to get some inter more interesting kind of interactions with these shapes. Just. Maybe hinting it that this may be able to segment at some point. That'd be kind of cool. I have no idea how to inbox on here. <laughs> um, just if you if you find my page um let's see if you here i'll just put i'll i'll type in here real quick oh no wait that that's um use uh at brendan isaiah bankston all right so just use that at brendan isaiah bankston and then just do a um, a message that way All right, let's see. I think this needs to come down. Do this kind of thing. I use Maximo. Yeah, um, I haven't really got into it though. I, I'm, I, I'm still. I, I usually give up on my projects by the time I get to that. <laughs> uh, I usually spend so much time uh, on the little details and stuff. By the by the time it gets there, I'm just like, all right, I'm over this. Uh, engine knowledge outside of Marmoset helps getting hired. Uh, yeah, I think if um, uh, learning and knowing some Unreal or um, God, what's the other one? I'm slipping my mind right now. Unreal Engine or Unity uh, is helpful. Uh, but at the very least, I would say be comfortable with uh, Marmoset to to kind of get things in and making sure that uh, your your idea and execution of your character is represented in, in a game engine of some kind. But a lot of times, um, studios have their own proprietary engine. So you're not expected to know a studio's proprietary engine to get the job. So look at it from that point of view, saying like, 
you don't, you shouldn't, you sh yeah. If it's an un Unreal job, yeah, you should probably know some Unreal. Uh, and depending on the level of work that you're being hired to do, whether it's a lead or, you know, project manager or something like that, then yeah, you should probably have some good experience in it. But if you're just, uh, you know, mid-level uh, character artist, uh, you wouldn't really be expected to to be a, a whiz at um, Unreal. I would say know it, uh, know how to get around in it, um, but it, it your work should your work in in the quality of your work should speak to why you get hired. The technical stuff can be taught. <laughs> no problem, Danny. I'll see what I'll see what I can do. No promises, but I'll see what I I see what I can do. Just talk with um, Chimera. <laughs> uh, I still feel bad about that. Sorry, dude. All right. Um, all right. Let's let's see how we doing here. Why can't we get good sculpting with a mouse? Uh, that's because it's not intuitive to the motion of uh, sculpting. <laughs> at all. It's also not pressure sensitive. It's not, yeah. That's. I mean, you can if you really want to, but the time it would take you to get good at that, uh, you could already be good at sculpting uh, normally. So you could spend the time proving a point or just get better at work. All right, so I'm trying to get some good depth happening in here where we got like higher high points, lower low points, while also making sure that um, kind of stick with the, the motif here. Maybe this this line comes down like that. Um, I still use um, I still use my mouse to do hard surface work uh, instead of, especially for like in here when you're when you're doing work on uh, the Z modeler brush. I use my mouse all the time. It's because I'm a rebel like that. I'm a rebel. Raw. So I'm, I'm also trying to do this thing where um, some of these shapes kind of feel like they're interlocking a little bit. Like how the radius and ulna kind of interlock into your humerus. Right? You have kind of like these kind of things that shapes that kind of like dive into each other a little bit and it feels almost like bone joints so i'm trying to to kind of have that effect a little bit so it feels a little more um organic right because these are these are kind of bony structures on uh on the arm so maybe this this type of um interlacing actually works pretty good we'll see if it does so this is like a bone joint, and this is a a bone nub. Nub. My name is Nub. Anybody know that reference? <laughs> yeah. My name is Nub. Yeah, I mean, um, I've been asked uh, a couple of times to do uh, feedback sessions. Um, maybe interested in doing that if there's enough uh, interest in in people having their work critiqued.
That's kind of cool. It almost feels like a, a, a what is that? A extra dermal bone, bony structure. Chitness, chitness. Um, sometimes when I open a ZBrush, I feel stupid and I don't want to do anything. Yeah, that, that happens to me all the time, IBM. <laughs> I, f I open up ZBrush and I'm like, oh, I really want to do this part of the day right now. Um, but then it, then I get in and I, I force myself to, actually, I used this mantra for quite a while when I was, um, kind of trying to come up in the industry. Um, it's a, it's actually an equation uh, that I use quite a bit, which is um, dedication is greater than inspiration. Let that sink in. Dedication is greater than inspiration. Um, do you think that uh, your art director is going to wait for you to have a spurt of inspiration to get that model done by the end of the sprint? Mm -mm. You better learn. <laughs> you better learn pretty quick how to get over that whole um, I don't feel inspired uh, bug. It don't that don't that don't fly, man. Oh, uh, you know, you know, I don't know, Mr. Art Director. I just not really feel like doing art today. <laughs> yeah, that doesn't that that don't fly. So in uh, dedication is greater than inspiration. So work on how to be dedicated to your craft and how to get work done and get yourself out of funks. Uh, because that's more important than waiting to feel inspired to do art. What method do you use to block out your colors in this stage? I, I just use a general fill. Um, so like I'll, I'll take uh, this subtool and then I will just color pick and then just do a fill, fill object. So I'll just do full color fills. Unless it's uh, something like the face up here, where um, I'll just make sure that I have enough topology, and then I'll just paint just real quick. So that's how I, I blocked in just some really quick uh, makeup in here uh, for the lips and for the eyes and for the eyebrows. I think it's important to get colors and values in uh, early because it really helps with the overall presentation of, of the character and how well, uh, how true to the concept that you're actually landing um, earlier than later. So I, tr I try to do this sooner than later. May I ask, uh, Dong Lee says, may I ask how to make animation friendly topology? Is there an example I can look at? Um, I would honestly, I would just Google that, uh, Dong Ling. I'd just say, hey, uh, for character art, uh, animation friendly topology. I think that's probably the the best bet. The biggest the biggest thing for and you know I I guess you know I could take these into account. Let's say the basic idea is that you need enough geo for things to move and to bend and to hold their form, right? So in the areas that you have more deformation, you need more geo to be able to hold the shape. That's that's basically it. And then, uh, so it's it's have enough geo, but then also make sure that your um, your geo is moving in the right directions, right? So I don't want to have geometry that's going this way when it's going to bend here like this, right? So just keep your your edge loops um, consistent with the way that the thing bends uh, and make sure that there's enough geo there. So something like this. Okay, where was I at? Holy cow, it's almost three o'clock? You guys didn't tell me it's almost three o'clock already. Gee, many cricket. Oh, ba -ba -ba -ba. If the art station homepage, actually, uh, Dan, Danny says, if the art station homepage doesn't inspire you, then it isn't for you. Um, honestly, I, I try not to look at the art station front page 
because it more often than not depresses me <laughs> because I'm like, dang, these people are awesome. Look at all the great work that these people are doing that I'm not doing right now. God, I suck. <laughs> uh, so actually, personally, I, I, I keep away from that unless I'm like in bed or, you know, somewhere that I that I know I'm not like, you know, feeling pressured to do work. Because if I if I look at that fr that front page, I'm just like, oh my god, I suck. What am I doing with my life right now? And so on. <laughs> Love the details just below her mouth. Thanks. Yeah, it's it's a little bit of a yeah, not not prepped for a kiss at all. It's very standoffish, standoffish shapes. Yeah, the 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 horns are uh, very. Uh, this this person needs to kind of exist in in large spaces, not small corridors. <laughs> in studio, do you make the tertiary details in Substance Painter or on the model itself? That's actually a really good question. Again, Mazin. Again, with the deep questions. Why do you do this to me? You normally have two minutes left in my stream. <sighs> oh wait. Pro said, if you can't generate inspiration and need to wait for it to randomly strike, you're not going to get far as an artist. It's very true. And that's why the dedication is greater than inspiration, is because it's it's you're dedicated to the craft. It's just like working out, right? When you're like, oh, I just, uh, man, I don't feel like going to the gym. No, you get your ass up and you go to the gym. Of course, I say these words and I, I don't really do that. I, I typically will just be like, I don't feel like going to the gym. <laughs> um but but that's what it is you know if you're if you're training if if you're going to be elite you have to you have to train and guaranteed the amount of time that you have to train far outweighs the time and the many of hours that you feel like doing it guaranteed across the board for for any profession um, do you think you have a responsibility as an artist to foster your culture heritage uh, before it's wiped away? No, not really. I I'm I think I think it, in that vein, it's more about uh, I feel an inspiration to foster creativity and expression. I think that's the big thing: is creativity and expression. Uh, that that's the biggest thing. How do I how do I express the things that I feel in shape and form? And presence presence is such a huge thing. Um, so in studio, do you? I'm gonna get back to yours, Mazin. Um, in in a second, and just grab. Uh, yeah, her her neck has to be super jacked. Yes. Uh, the name of this character is Demon General. That's it. There's no character for it. There's no name. Um, maybe we could do some kind of uh, poll for for a good name. You like Lisa. You know, L Lisa, I feel like it would be a good name for her, maybe. Or like Gertrude. <laughs> oh, do you want to see my Z? Look, here's my Z tools. Yeah, I, I'm... I have 107 of them. They're they're not getting named. Um, okay, so in studio, do you make tertiary details in Substance Painter or in the model itself? Um, and that's where what I was saying earlier about um, about knowing your full full pipeline and understanding what details, what tertiary details you can get out of materials versus the underlying forms, and that comes with experience. Um, <laughs> tinkle bottom you would pro <laughs> um what i what i've been doing is i've been doing a lot less tertiary detail and more just secondary form detail because i know that with a good material pass you can get a ton of tertiary details so uh i i will typically keep a lot of the tertiary details for, for that unless it's like skin details which are, are pretty tough to get um, in in materials. Um, 
for what game or movie is this? This is just a concept from Bjorn Huri. Uh, you see on the bottom left of your screen, it's uh, there's an abomination. You guys probably can't even see that because I'm. That's why everybody's like, oh, why are you streaming at 720? Is because you can't read this thing. I get it now. Hold on. There you go. This is the book that it's from. Abominations. Uh, I think it's only through Kickstarter at the moment. And I think the Kickstarter is well and done. So uh, if you can get your hands on this book, I highly, highly suggest it because uh, the work that he does in here for the concepts is, are just super, 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 super sick. Sick. Do you use folders in ZBrush? Um, I use folders only, usually only when I'm about to start prepping for low res. Uh, then I'll start kind of dividing things up. But when I'm in, in this phase where I'm just in kind of block out and starting um, high res stuff, I, I, I typically don't. It, just because managing 107 uh, subtools just becomes so much more difficult than, uh, than I'm willing to accept. I don't want to waste my time doing that. So... Okay, we do have to wrap soon. Probably give it a couple more minutes and then um, answer up any any final questions that we can get out of the way. Where does that feel? What if we do? What if we kind of mimic that same one here? Do I use PureRef? Um, I do sometimes, but mostly I use uh, this 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 ref program called Quadro with a K. Uh, I've used it for quite a while, and I love it. But it's really about what you're comfortable with and um, what you what you like using. I'd say usually what you have access to, but both of those programs are free, so. Um, good question, Rabs. How long does a hero character like this normally take in a full-time studio setting? Um, if you have a, a, a solid concept, um, full production on this, I could, let's say if I was going to give this to one of my team, um, I would say uh, at least a good couple of months, probably even longer. Uh, I'd say... I'd like to have it wrapped in no longer than, say, 15 weeks. Um, but then you have to see, you know, where you're at. Um, that's the accumulated time. In actual calendar time, it may take a lot longer than that, just because you're having to kind of um, do other things and go to meetings and talk. Yeah. It. I mean, so this is for highly realistic in-game. Uh, character, right? So, and this is all uh, uh, LOD zero uh, work. Honestly, it'd be a lot longer. Uh, it'd probably be six months uh, if you had a full head of hair on this as well, at least. Um, and then it depends on, uh, you know, do you have a scan of the head, a scan of the body? Um, what are your, what if your, what are your solutions for? Um, for speech, you know, are you doing a, a full uh, fax scan session for the character head? Are you having to do um, all the blend shapes by hand? 
Uh, it I mean it could you could be working on this character for quite, quite a long time, especially something that is fairly complicated. Um, you could easily go into a, a while, and then you have you know revisions and bug fixing and and all that kind of stuff. So when you actually look at a character in a game, like it, it's a massive amount of work and it's a massive amount of time to get those characters into a video game. You're probably looking at you're say okay let's say let's say you you make a hundred thousand dollars a year right as a as an artist. Uh, that's what let's say it's maybe sixty bucks an hour, right? Well let's say for the sake of yeah let's say sixty bucks an hour, right? And it takes you six months to do. That's that's a lot of money. Right? And that's just modeling. That's not the concept artist's time. That's not the rigger's time. That's not the animator's time. That's not the physics person's time. That's not the special effects person's time. That's not the time it takes for your tech artist to make sure that your tools are working correctly. I mean, you're looking at... You know, one of these characters could cost you $100,000 in the game. Like... And that's why when you move to like doing freelance stuff that like the the cost is astronomical to get a, a, a high res, realistic, complicated character into a triple A title game. It's crazy. It, the, yeah, the amount of money is, is just bonkers. Yeah, Blend Chase by Hand is, is worse than doing hair. I have to agree. All right. Um, I think that is probably going to be it for me today. I didn't really get a whole lot of work done. I got a whole lot of jabber, jabberwocky done. Flabberjack. Mandibular flabberjacking done. We, we flab quite a bit. Um, but I think that I think we nailed on some, some good stuff today. So uh, we got a little bit of work done on, on the arm. I feel it's uh, this still feels like a, a large a small piece of poo here uh, I'm not crazy about this yet I don't know about this this shape in here eh, we'll see we'll see we'll, we'll, well I think it's a it's a nice nod to some of the things that are happening here but I I, I feel like I kind of ventured away from some of the design motifs that are happening here and kind of did my own thing in here. So I, I may go back and just do it, redo it again. We'll see. Nothing worse than the streamer doesn't interact. It does happen. It does happen. Um, how many revisions do the characters undergo on average? Uh, it depends, man. It could be anywhere from, oh my god, that's awesome, put it in the game, to you spend two months reworking things. <laughs> All right. Um, it's great info. Thanks for that. Uh, be interested in a critique session if you decide to do that at some time. Yeah, I may do that. Um, I, I guess the, the 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 tough thing would be how to get enough interest and like a poll of some kind in the right place at the right time. Maybe what I'll do is next session we'll have a little poll or something uh, where I take people who may want a session like that and say okay here's here's the time that i have to do it who is interested in getting stuff submitted for um critique at this time so it'd have to be set up like pre-planned that way cool all right um if you guys would like to go back and watch some of the previous blockout stuff or even do it from, uh, check this out from the beginning, uh, you can go to ZBrushLive.com and find my uh, artist page, Brennan Isaiah Bankstrom. Uh, and then all those will, will be there. You can also go to the Pixelogic YouTube channel and they have replays of all of the streamers. Um, if you go there, prepare to lose much time. <laughs> I find uh, that that YouTube channel of Pixelogix is uh, great to have on kind of on the side when you are working, like uh, you know where you can watch somebody else do work while you do your own work and kind of just sit there, or just come back to um, the Pixelogix Twitch page uh, for live events like this. And uh, yeah, thanks for all the great uh, conversation. Thanks for the great questions 
And um, I hope you guys had fun. I hope you guys learned a couple things. And most of all, I hope you were inspired. Inspired to go out and make cool shit. So get out there and you go make some cool stuff. And don't forget, when you're not making cool stuff, watch the world around you. Use your eyeballs to look at things and figure out why they're doing a certain thing. Why are you reacting to something? Uh, why does it make you feel some way? And even more granular than that, how does it do it? Why does this thing look like this? What are, is it because of the light? Is it because of the shapes? Is it because of the values that are around it? Like those types of things. Um, oh, spear. Sorry about, I forgot the rope thing. Yeah, I, I'll try. I actually covered that on a couple of sessions ago. Um, you can take a look at that one. Or find it. All right, uh, I think that's it. I'm going to go. It's been fun. It's been real. It's been real fun. All right. See you cats later. Good to see you, everybody. And uh, we'll check you on the next round. Later.